Let's take a closer look at Beer's Law. Beer's Law tells us that there will be a linear relationship between absorbance and concentration for our absorbing species. However, occasionally we observe a deviation from a straight line. Why is that? The problem usually arises because we've violated one of the assumptions that the Beer's Law is based on. One of those assumptions is that we are using monochromatic light. Yet we know that we're using a real instrument and there is a finite bandpass or range of wavelengths that are actually used when we are tuned to a particular wavelength. In better instruments, the bandpass will be very narrow and its effect will be negligible. But what happens if it's not negligible? Remember that absorbance is a calculated value and it depends upon the intensities of the light going into and exiting or transmitted through the sample. The instrument doesn't discriminate between one wavelength and another when it light reaches the detector. Consider a cuvette with some absorbing solution. Consider a ray of light with one particular wavelength going through here. Now let another ray of light be passing through the same sample, but at a different wavelength. For either wavelength, we'll find that the intensity that's transmitted is proportional to the intensity going into the sample at that wavelength, times 10 to the minus epsilon bc, where epsilon is a function of that particular wavelength. The instrument is going to calculate the absorbance from the total transmitted intensity over the total incoming intensity at all the wavelengths. The problem is that this ratio does not converge to the linear relationship between absorbance and concentration. If either the molar absorptivities at the two wavelengths are not equal, or the intensities going into the sample at the two wavelengths are not equal, then this relationship does not converge or simplify to absorbance equals epsilon b c. And our calibration curve would look something like this. When are these conditions going to exist? Imagine that we have an absorption band as a function of wavelength, something like this. If the instrument is tuned up on the side of the peak, then we get a range of wavelengths that has widely different epsilon values. And that will lead to a nonlinear calibration curve. Much better performance results if we line up the spectrometer in the center of the peak. When we do that, the variation of the molar absorptivity is much smaller, and we get the expected linear calibration curve. Another condition that leads to a negative deviation from Beer's Law is the presence of stray light. Beer's Law assumes that the only light in the system follows a straight line path through the sample to the detector. The detector will respond to any light that strikes it. So if light leaks into the instrument from the room and strikes the detector, it's stray light. Likewise, a beam of light from our source that bounces around in the instrument and leads to the detector is also stray light. The instrument will use that intensity as part of the calculation for the apparent absorbance. Consider a constant intensity of stray light reaching the detector throughout the course of a series of measurements. The transmitted intensity will have this extra intensity in the numerator. Likewise, in the denominator, an extra term will show up. And the transmitted intensity will be I sub naught times 10 to the minus epsilon bc.
may be that the stray intensity is small compared to the incident intensity, and even at low concentrations, it might be small compared to the transmitted intensity. And the calculated absorbance would be essentially proportional to concentration. But at high concentrations, 10 to the minus epsilon BC gets smaller and smaller, and I sub s will not be negligible. Once again, we have a negative deviation in Beer's law. Another problem that leads to non ideal behavior results when different rays follow different path lengths in going through a sample solution. Consider a round cuvette. A ray going through the center of the cuvette will have the longest path length possible. A ray traversing the solution further away from the center will have a shorter path length through the solution. Light passing along these different rays will not show the same proportionality between concentration and absorbance. The take-home lesson then is to keep the width of the beam very narrow so the path lengths are essentially constant. One of our assumptions is that the fraction of the analyte or sought for substance in the measured form is constant for all the standards and samples we use. We know that some molecules can exist in different forms in solution. For example, a molecule from an acid-base family can exist in more than one form. It is quite possible that the spectra of the two different forms from the same acid-base family may be quite different from each other. Acid-base indicators are particularly good examples of this sort of difference. Here are sketches of the spectra for the two different forms for methyl orange. Obviously, holding the pH constant for all standards and samples is critical for obtaining a linear absorbance versus concentration relationship. However, there are some situations where it might be impractical to control conditions such as pH. In those cases, the wavelength at the crossing point also called the isospestic point, marks the wavelength where both species have the same molar absorptivity. One can monitor the absorbance at the isospestic point, and it will be proportional to the sum of the concentrations for the two species. The calibration will be a straight line regardless of the pH. Holding the temperature constant is also wise, since not only can the equilibria shift among different species for an analyte, but a spectrum for a single species may show a shift in wavelength for the absorption peak. Another assumption that we make is that our experiments are free of photo effects. Important photo effect is photo decomposition. When a molecule absorbs a photon in the visible or ultraviolet region, it excites an electron into an upper state. That usually weakens one or more bonds and can lead to the breaking of a bond by photo decomposition. In order to minimize the chances for photo decomposition, instruments are usually built with the wavelength isolation device between the light source and the sample. This cuts down on the total light that the sample sees. Another practical problem is the loss of light caused by particles in the sample solution that scatter the light. Scattering due to particles lower the transmitted intensity and lead us to a falsely high value for the apparent absorbance. Since particles tend to scatter light over a wide range of wavelengths, it is common to see a, an absorbance band sitting on top of the scattered background. 
A common remedy to a scattering problem is to measure the peak of interest above the absorbance of the background. As illustrated here, a straight line is drawn in to approximate what the background is below the peak of interest and the difference between that line and the absorbance at the height of the peak is taken as the estimate of the absorbance that's proportional to the concentration of our analyte.